live in. And we praise you and thank you for that. Now give us understanding to your word, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. In the book of Genesis, we hear about Noah's obedience as he builds the ark, and yet the guy's never seen a drop of rain, right? And, and we're familiar with Abraham's faith when God told him to go, and, he's, and he, he goes, but he doesn't know where he's going. And, and, and also later on in Genesis, at the very end, we learn about Joseph's forgiveness where he looks at his brothers and said, you know, you meant it for evil, but God means it for good. In 1 Samuel, we learn about the prophet Nathan's boldness when he walks up to King David and, I don't know, points his bony finger in King David's chest and says, you are the man, King David. Not, not in a middle school way, like you're the man, okay? But you're, you're the guilty one, King David. And all of a sudden, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, we learn about another type of Christian, not the obedient Noah, not the faithful Abraham, the forgiving Joseph, the courageous uh, Moses, uh, or, or the bold Nathan. We learn about another type of Christian, a fearful one. And they were fearful for a couple of different reasons. Uh, they were confused about the end times. The, the day of the Lord had been talked about and false prophets and false teachers had, had come in and said that they had missed the day of the Lord. And so they were fearful. We have confessed Jesus as our Lord and Savior, and he said that he was going to return for us, and, and we missed him? What's, what's going on? Not only that, but Paul, who's, who's writing the book of 2 Thessalonians, says that the Antichrist, when he comes, he will deceive even those who know Jesus. And so there was fear of like, oh no, is it possible that I too, even though I'm confessing Jesus Christ, could be deceived? And not only that, there's this, there's this prevailing, prevailing spirit, pervasive spirit of antichrist uh, that is at large. It's, it's, it's called the man of lawlessness. So they're just an anti-God spirit. And so they were fearful as they lived in these end times. So 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 13 through 17 are written in here for fearful Christians. Fearful Christians, people who are fearful specifically about the end times. And so here's the big idea of our message this morning, and that is this. Though fearful of the end times, you can, and yes, will be, faithful and fruitful, for Jesus is with you. The big idea is this. Though fearful of the end times, you can be, and I want to say from this text, you will be faithful and fearful because Jesus is with you. And so I've titled our message this morning, Fearful Yet Faithful and Fruitful. And Paul begins in, begins in an unusual way. He, he gives thanks to God for something that we haven't heard him ever give thanks to God for, at least as of yet, in First and Second Thessalonians. Look at it in First, Second Thessalonians, chapter two, verse thirteen. It reads this way: "But we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved." Paul gives thanks to God, God, God gives, gives thanks to God because God chose the Thessalonians. In other, in other places, he uses the word like this. He elects or selects, maybe, is the idea too. That is, this election, this, this choosing, what happened is it's a selection of an individual for a chosen purpose. That is, we would say it this way, they were saved on purpose for a purpose. Fearful Christians, not just faithful, strong Christians, but any born-again child of God was, is chosen, you were saved on purpose for a purpose. And that purpose is this. The Thessalonians, did you see this, were called the first fruits. God chose you as first fruits to be saved. Now, I am not the son of a farmer. I'm not the, you know, I, I think my dad gardened a little bit. But what, is, what are first fruits? 
For you gardeners, you understand what first fruits are, but the first fruits was right in the beginning of harvest season when you had the ability to pick off, to pick from that vine the very first tomato, maybe to pull from the ground that very first carrot, to pull from that tree the very first apple. And when you saw first fruits come off that tree or on that vine or from the ground, it was telling you this, that there was more harvest to come. There was more fruitfulness that was going to come. Paul, who's writing this letter, he's the great apostle, he's writing this letter to the group called Thessalonians in the city there in Greece. And he says, I want you to know this, you are are the first fruits. Meaning by that, what God started in their lives, he's going to multiply it out in many other people's lives there in Thessalonica. That is, a, a first fruit was the, the first harvest. And it, we, could, we could say it this way, that if, if the first part of verse 13 is the divine side of how salvation works, the second half of verse 13 is the human side, if we can say it that way. It's if one side is what happened in eternity past, the second half of verse 13 is what happens now. That is, all those individuals who got, who got baptized out there, at one point in time in their life, they got, to use Bible language, saved how did that happen in their lives? Well, page 989 and verse 13 of chapter 2 explains it this way. He says that uh, we give thanks to God for you, brothers, beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as first fruits to be saved. How did that happen? Through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. That is, when a person gets saved, there are two things going on. The Holy Spirit of God, the third person of the Trinity, is entering their lives and is, and is changing them, or the word sanctifying them. And not only that, but something had to happen to trigger that. They had to believe the truth of the gospel. They had to believe what God says. The truth of the gospel is this, is that God sent his only son, Jesus, to die for sinful people, that we weren't born naturally good, that we were born sinners. No one taught us how to, no one taught us how to lie. No one taught us how to deceive. And that Jesus lived the life that we could not live. He died on the cross, and on dying on the cross, God the Father, like the song we sang today, poured, God the Father poured his wrath on Jesus Christ. He did that. Jesus Christ became the substitute, the, the substitute who took our punishment. That is, any who will believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus took your punishment so that you would not have to receive punishment from God the Father. And rather, instead of receiving punishment from God the Father, what you received was this. You received the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That is the truth of the gospel, that Jesus died, that he was buried for three days, and that he rose again, and he sits at the right hand of the Father. For those who believe that, that is the truth of the gospel. And Paul continues re reading this way, verse 14. He says, to this he called you through our gospel, so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is, those who have experienced the work of the Spirit by believing the truth of the gospel are assured of something. You are assured of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Did you know that the Bible reserves the word glory for God alone? In Psalm 24, God is described as the king of glory. In Psalm 29, he's described as the God of glory. In Ephesians chapter 1, he's referred to as the Father of glory. And so when Paul, who's writing this letter, says to the Thessalonians, hey, I want you to know, though you are fearful, you will receive the glory of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Paul is taking his pen and he's underlining and saying, this God who is referred to as glory in the Old Testament and the Father of glory, Jesus Christ. Christ has the same glory. Jesus Christ is God come in flesh. And the only other time 
that glory is mentioned within relationship to mankind is this. Romans chapter 6, 23 explains that those who have sinned have fallen short of the glory of God. And yet Paul is saying what you have, fearful Christians, is you have the assurance that you will experience the glory of the risen and ascended Christ. Now, do you know how many times we speak of what it means to be saved? This is very common language, and I'm not faulting you if, if, you've, if you have used this language like this. We say things like this, I ask Jesus into my heart, and I understand what we mean when we say that. But folks, Paul wants us to understand that if you've been born again, you, you can say something much more than just, I ask Jesus into my heart. He wants you to be able to say this, that you will experience the glory of Jesus Christ one day. And he's writing this to fearful Christians, not great Christians who can stand up or write Sunday school lessons or some other, some other capacity. He's writing this to fearful Christians. So to the greatest of saints, they receive the glory of Jesus Christ. And to the most fearful, frightened saints, what do they receive? The glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is, so... Here is your sweet assurance, saints, from God, that though fearful of the end times, you can be hopeful. You can be certain, certain that this hope is certain, that you can be confident of heaven. The eternal home of the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ is yours to fearful Christians, confident that because you believe the truth of the gospel and have experienced salvation by the Spirit of God, that the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ is as much yours as it is the Apostle Paul's. And rather, those who believe this truth will certainly experience glory so that this gospel, Christian, this gospel that saves you is the same gospel that will sustain you in light of the end times. That the gospel that you confess, you never graduate beyond the gospel. You never get too mature for the gospel. Our understanding of the gospel only goes deeper. That is, this is the gospel that saves you, saints, fearful saints. It is also the same gospel that will sustain you. And did you notice this? Did you notice as we were working through those, did you notice the Trinity at play? Did you notice that it, was, it, it takes the Trinity to accomplish your salvation? That is, the Father planned it, chose. The Son accomplishes it, the cross. And the Spirit applies it. And so the Savior's glory is your ultimate end. That is, when the Godhead sets their eternal mind, their sovereign will, and their divine authority to accomplish salvation, you can be certain that eternal salvation will not nor cannot be thwarted. Or to say it this way, that's why you have eternal security in Christ. Because salvation was never about how much you could do and the good things you could work up to begin with. That salvation was planned by God, accomplished by Jesus, and applied by the Spirit of God. And thus you have the assurance that you too will see the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. What a beautiful thought to fearful believers. Now, look at verse 15. Verse 15, it reads this way. So then, brothers, stand firm and hold to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by our spoken word or by our letter. So here is the second sweet assurance for God's people, and that is this. Though fearful of end times, you must be faithful. Though fearful of the end times, 
You must be faithful. Now, there are two key words in verse 15, two key verbs. Let me say it that way. Two key verbs in verse 15. Did you see them? He says, stand firm and hold to the traditions. Now, what are the traditions? All right, this is a Baptist church. There's probably plenty of traditions Baptist churches have, right? He's not talking about those. He's not talking about the songs that, uh, that grandma sang. He's not talking about traditions like that. He's not talking about the, 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 the Bible that your great aunt uses, nothing like that. What he's talking about, the traditions that he says to stand firm in and to hold on to are these, the apostolic teachings, the doctrines of the Bible. Stand firm, hold fast to the traditions. And did you notice that those traditions came two ways? They came, how? By spoken word, and they came by letter. The, the Thessalonian, that church there in Thessalonica, they didn't walk in on a Sunday morning with a leather-bound Bible. They didn't whip open their phone and uh, open their Bible app. They didn't do any of that. They, they, had to, they had to stand fast and hold firm to the teachings that they received by word. You see, by Jesus' day, think about the time that Jesus was ministering. By Jesus' day, the Old Testament, that is, you know, Genesis all the way, and you, so many of those names in there you can't pronounce, and kind of a cryptic sometimes uh, books in there. The Old Testament was complete and recognized as authoritative. The printing press hadn't been published, so these were in scrolls, and they were primarily held in synagogues or in, 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 in the temple, right? The Gospels, not the Gospel, not the message, but the Gospels, you know, the Gospel of Matthew, the Gospel of Mark and Luke and John, they hadn't even been, they hadn't been recorded yet, right? The, the, the letters to the churches that we talk about here, right, Thessalonians and Corinthians, they had not been written. The apostles did the majority of the teaching, and they did so verbally. But as Christianity began to spread, the need to record and write becomes more apparent. And so the very first book written in the New Testament was not Matthew. It actually was the book of James, our Lord's half-brother. He's one of the pastors at the Jerusalem church, and he pens that letter called the letter, the epistle of James. And then after that, one of the very first letters that, was, that followed the letter of James were, were the book of First and Second Thessalonians, the ones that we've been studying. And, and they, 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 they took some time and as they were written. And Paul says, I want you to stand firm, to hold fast to what the, the spoken word and to the letters. That is, don't waver. Jude refers to it as this. He refers to, don't waver on the faith once delivered to the saints, that is, the traditions, the, the faith once delivered to the saints. Saints, meaning that by that, believers, those who are in Christ. Not referring to, to, to individuals that you would pray to, but saints, meaning if you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you need to hold fast to the faith once delivered to the saints. And over the centuries, there have been multiple attacks on the Christian faith. In the second century, one of the attacks on the Christian church, there were those who were trying to reconcile the God of the Old Testament with Jesus' teaching. And so there are passages in the Old Testament that are very difficult, right, where God will actually command the Israelites to wipe out an entire group of people. And Jesus comes in and teaching about love your neighbor. And because of the, the inability to reconcile these, some said well, the God of the Old Testament is different than the God of the, Old, uh, of the New Testament. That was, a, that was a, uh, an attack on the, on, the, on, the, on the Christian church, on the Bible specifically. And there are answers for those, for those things specifically. But in the, in the third century, the attack was not that. The attack was on the deity of Jesus Christ. Is Jesus actually God in flesh, or is he just kind of an enlightened prophet? In the 5th century, there was another uh, attack on the church of, of, of Jesus, and it, there was a monk by the, name, by, a, by the name of Pelagius. Pelagius taught this, that one could actually earn their way into divine grace, that you didn't need the grace that comes from God, 
But between the grace of God and the grace that you can earn, that those merge together, that you would find eternity in heaven. It was an attack on the Christian teaching that salvation is by Christ alone. In the 16th century, there was another attack. The attack was this, is will the church stand on, will the Christian church find the greatest authority in the Word of God, or will the authority be in the church itself? And so there was, a, there was an attack there. That is, every century along the way, there have been these attacks, and Christian people have had to decide, will I stand fast? Will I hold to the apostolic teaching that God has revealed to us? And sometimes the attacks are in ways that you wouldn't imagine. Sometimes the attacks aren't from the theological left. Sometimes they're from the theological right. That is, to become rigid or inflexible where the Scriptures are silent or left open to differing conclusions. In our century, the 21st century, it appears as if the attack is on the doctrine of man. I don't mean by that like male versus female. I just mean by that on humanity. That God has revealed certain truths about humanity and it appears as if, it, it, it's, it's like this. It's like Satan, I'm a football guy, right? It's like Satan is a great offensive coordinator. And if, he, and if, and if Satan can't get a touchdown, if he can't get a touchdown by the run game, what's he going to do? He's going to use the pass game. And if the pass game isn't going to work, he's going to use a quarterback sneak. And if the quarterback sneak isn't working, he's going to, I don't know, do some other trick play. And it's like every century there's another attack on the Christian church to try to undermine the gospel and to undermine the Bible. And in our culture today, or in the 21st century, it appears as if the Bible's teaching on humanity is under attack, and specifically on the autonomy of man versus the authority of God. So let me, get, let, let me make us all a little bit uncomfortable for the next few moments. The autonomy of man says, I can sleep with who I want to sleep with. The marriage covenant is antiquated. God, Paul would say, stand firm, hold fast to the traditions, to the teachings. The autonomy of man says, I can define marriage my way. The autonomy of man says, that gender is fluid, not God-given. And Christians and Christian churches must be faithful to the Scripture's teaching on these things. And I am specifically, I, I know that's not popular, but I'm specifically saying it because parents, you need to hear that. And you need to determine, is God's Word going to be authoritative in every area of my life? Is God's Word going to be authoritative in my marriage? Is God's Word going to be authoritative in how I raise my children? Is God's Word going to be authoritative? Does God have the authority or is man autonomous to make our own decisions to these things? Has God kind of just left that open? And what Paul would say to us, because as he says it to the Thessalonian church, is this, stand firm. Do so with kindness. Don't be a jerk, Right? Hold fast to the traditions given to the Christian church. In spite of opposition, saints, hold to the apostles' teaching. In spite of disapproval from family or friends, let God be true and every other man a liar. In spite of persecution, stand firm in, in doctrine. In spite of deceptive voices, don't be swayed. In spite of culture, stand firm for the faith once delivered to the saints. Be faithful to all of it. That the Bible is not a buffet that I get to choose a little bit here and a little bit there. And I kind of end on the dessert side because that's what I really like. Like, I need to listen to all of God's Word. That the Bible is God's revelation to God's people to live God's ways. And these final verses, these verses given to us are a reminder that as we are, folks, so when we talk about fearful of the end times, you're like, well, Mosier, I don't, I don't listen to the quacks on YouTube 
or the weirdos that come on at like 12 o'clock at night. Like, I'm not fearful of those. Those guys are weird. But what I just said about standing firm and holding fast to the traditions, when I started talking about some of those things, because every one of us has a niece we dearly love or a nephew that we've gone on vacation with. And again, you don't need to be a jerk, but you need to hold fast and stand firm to the Scripture's teaching. See, in that way, you may not be fearful about missing the return of Christ, but we can be fearful about whether or not we're going to be faithful to the Scriptures. These final verses are then our sweet assurance. These last two verses are a sweet assurance to fearful Christians, right? And that is this. Though fearful of the end times, you will be fruitful spiritually fruitful. You'll be fruitful. Paul writes these, th- he's writing this letter not to pastors or not to those Christians with great faith, but he's writing to those who are fearful of being faithful to the very end, to the time when Christ returns. And he says this, he, he gives this apostolic prayer. This apostolic prayer is inspired by the Spirit of God. So I know that this prayer is going to be answered. Look at it, verse 16. Now, may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. That is, that the, the future comfort, right? Eternal comfort and that good hope. How does it come? What are the last two words of verse 16? How does comfort and hope come from? Where does it come? Through what? Through grace. grace. Yeah. If you want eternal comfort and you want the confidence of heaven, you only get it through the bridge of God's grace. That's how it comes. But did you notice notice this, that Paul uses the past tense, speaking of the future. Did you notice that? Look at verse 16 again. It says this, Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us, past tense, and gave us, past tense, eternal comfort and good hope through grace. Why in the world is Paul using the past tense for something that's in the future? He must have failed grammar school, right? Clearly, he didn't have anyone do a spell check on this. The the little red squiggly lines were underneath here, and he just sent it off without checking. No, the reason why he uses the past tense about the future, it's as if to say that the future is so certain, saints, that it's as good as done. That's why he uses the past tense. Now, may that same God who, will, who gave you eternal comfort and, and hope, it may, that same God who's going to do that in the past and did it in the, in the future, may he, and now in the present, right now, may he establish fearful Christians in every good work and word. So these are fearful Christians, and he, Paul says, I'm praying, I'm praying that God will establish every good work and word. That is, living in the end times is not a call for fearful Christians to retreat. That God's people, we don't know retreat. We can know rest. We can know kind of catching our breath, but we don't turn back. We don't, we don't turn back. We don't retreat. We, we march forward. That living in the end times is a call for us to advance because the triune God establishes our ministry of deed and word. And so why do we, why do we keep talking, Grace Life, about starting a, another church someday? Because we believe that God is establishing our work and our word. 
and that he intended for the, for the Thessalonians, not for them to be us for and no more, but that actually that the gospel would go out through fearful Christians. You say, how do you know that God wants fearful Christians to be the one to share his work and word? Well, look at verse 13 again. He says this, right? God shows you as what? As the first fruits to be saved. And so what God did in your heart through salvation, he is intending to do in the hearts of others. Do you remember what it was like before Jesus came into your life? Do you remember the, the peaceless nights? Do you remember the haunting thoughts? Do you remember the, the fear of the unknown? What God did in your heart and in your mind, he plans on doing in the hearts and minds of others. This is what God, it's like this. Have you ever seen a picture? Have you ever seen a picture on Google Maps from space? And there's like the Nile River running down there in Africa. And then all, all of a sudden you see those, those tributaries kind of shoot off. And in the middle of that brown desert, you have nice lush greenery on either side of the Nile River. But those tributaries, if we call the Nile River the gospel, those tributaries are our lives. And what do you see on either side of those tributaries? You see some nice green grass. Some are more lush than others. Some are little shoots and they're just beginning. You are the first fruit, fearful Christian. And what God did in your heart, he's going to continue to do in your family. He's going to continue to do on your street. He's going to continue to do in your life group. He's going to continue to do at your place of work that the gospel is not supposed to end in the cul-de-sac of your life, but that rather the gospel is to be a thoroughfare through running through your lives, affecting other people. This is what God calls fearful Christians too. And I know that this work is the work of the ministry, and I know it's the word that is the Bible. You say, how do you know that? Well, look at chapter 3, the very next verse. Chapter 3, verse 1. Finally, brothers, pray for us that the word of the Lord may speed ahead and be honored as happened among you. So Paul says, hey, just like I'm praying for you, I want you to pray for me. That God's word may advance and go forward. So fearful Christians, you can, be, you can be certain of sharing the future glory with the risen, ascended Christ. Fearful Christians are faithful Christians. Fearful Christians are fruitful Christians. And you may not have, you may not have the obedience of Noah. You may not have the faith of Abraham. You may not have the forgiveness of Joseph, the courage of Moses, the boldness of Nathan, but you've got the fear of the Thessalonians. And you may not count yourself among the Christians to have a biography recorded about you, a sermon illustration given about you, a blog article posted about you, or worship lyrics written by you. But what you share in common with the Thessalonians isn't just fear. You share Jesus. That's what you share in common, which is why the Bible records these two verses. In Hebrews chapter 2, the Bible says this, for it was fitting that he, that is Jesus, for whom and by whom all things exist, that one Jesus, and bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies, that is, for he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers. It is God who sanctifies. We are the ones who are sanctified. And because of that, Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers. So are you fearful of the end times? Maybe not fearful of the exact timing like some would be, 
but fearful about standing fast, standing firm and holding fast. Jesus would say, I am not ashamed to call you brother. I'm not ashamed to call you sister. Fearful of cancer diagnoses, fearful of doctor appointments, fearful about your children, what God would say to you and Jesus would say to you is this, I'm not afraid to call fearful Christians my brothers and my sisters because we all have the same source from God our Father. He has, Jesus has the confidence of the triune God that you will be faithful and fruitful until the day of the Lord. May it be so. Father, grant to fearing 